for another edition of the CBS Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. Welcome to the Mystery Theater. I'm Hyman Brown. The belief in ghosts and apparitions is as ancient as man himself. And a ghost, as we all know, can take many forms and shapes. Most of these spirits return from an unhappy grave and haunt the living. But occasionally, a ghost will turn up who is kindly, good-natured, and rather nice to have around. Our story involves just such a ghost. Cousin Amy, come quickly, quickly. What's wrong, sir? And there's a strange man in this room, Cousin Amy, or was just a moment ago. Where? Where did you see him? Standing there, right in the middle of the room, in front of my dressing glass, oh. staring at me in my nightgown and wrapper. I was terrified. What did he look like? His clothes were of the strangest fashion. And his neck. Yes? His neck was twisted. The head was tilted over to one side, as though the head were just barely attached to the rest of the body. Oh. Oh, you've got to stay the night with me right here in my bedroom. Oh, of course. I wouldn't think of leaving you. We are not alone in this house, believe me. There is a third person here somewhere. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Third Person, is based on the Henry James classic and was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Stella and Arnold Moss. It stars Marion Seldes. Do you know... The year is 1900. In a neat little village on the seacoast of New England, Miss Susan Frush is a rather shy lady in her early 40s. In her well-fastened hat, her white gloves, her sturdy walking shoes, she is what might be called a typical old maid. She has the appearance of once having been pretty, but this is now somewhat obscured by eyeglasses and teeth. Her kinswoman, Miss Amy Frush, Ten years, Miss Susan's junior is brisk, eager, comparatively bold, and equally unhusbanded. Until this morning, these second cousins have never before met. Now they sit rather primly and a little terrorized in the parlor of a roomy mansion to which they have been summoned by a Mr. Willoughby, attorney at law. Miss Susan Frush? Yes. You are Susan Frush. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm Susan Frush. Uh, thank you. And you are Miss Amy Frush. Oh, yes, indeed. I certainly am. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies, you are both aware of why you are here. As the sole remaining heirs of your great aunt, the late Miss Abigail Frush, recently deceased at the age of 94, you two are the rightful legatees in equal shares of her entire properties. Do you mean, sir, that all... I mean, madam, that as executor of the late Miss Abigail's worldly estate, I hereby declare you, Miss Susan Frush, and you, Miss Amy Frush, the sole beneficiaries. The largest single item of her benevolence is, of course, <laughs> this house. You mean... This house now belongs to the two of us? To me and to Cousin Amy? Well, after a few legal documents are properly signed, if you ladies will permit me to say so, Miss Abigail's generosity has been most remarkable, particularly in view of the fact that you're both unprotected without the care of solicitude of husbands. Aunt Abigail has indeed been generous. Well, uh, since, as I understand, you are both almost strangers to each other, you may not wish to share this house between you. The will directs that the house may be sold to your joint advantage. Uh, are there any questions? No, I don't think so. Mm, Miss Susan? You've made everything quite clear, thank you. Well, in that case, I shall take the liberty of escorting you about the house and indicating some of its features. 
the high points, we might say, of this old mansion. It consists, as you shall see, of 37 rooms, 12 of which are bedrooms. Twelve bedrooms? For just the two of us? On the second floor, shared by the two largest of these bedrooms, installed some 15 years ago, is a marvel of this modern age in which we live. And that, Mr. Willoughby, is... Uh, There, with all the latest paraphernalia and conveniences of indoor plumbing, is the bathroom. Oh. Yes. Imagine, ladies, the luxury of an indoor bathroom uh, with running water. What's... what's that? What is what? Do you hear anything, Cousin Amy? Yes, I do. It sounds as though someone were running a bath in our luxurious indoor bathroom. Well, now that you've seen the principal features of the house, I remind you again that the will permits you to sell it, should you be so minded. Oh, I wouldn't think of it, Mr. Willoughby. This dear old house is exactly everything I ever dreamed of. And you, Cousin Amy? Oh, I wouldn't part with it for all the money in the world. It's beautiful. Having drunk deep of the cup of singleness, which I confess is a rather bitter cup, this house represents a quiet, peaceful harbor. Our solitude will come to an end. And, of course, with an assured roof over your head. I adore every inch of it. I'm sure the two of us will get along splendidly. As am I. (laughs) Ah, but you must understand, of course, that I take a nap after dinner. Really? I could never rest then. That's when I'm most wide awake and keenest for talk. I take my nap just before dinner. But I'm sure we can arrange our time suitably. And there'll be so many things to talk about. So many things we can do together. Yes. <clears throat> well, I take it then that you ladies are fully prepared to share the house. Oh, yes, oh, of course. Well, so be it. I am delighted that this charming house will remain where it's been for almost 200 years. In the hands of the Frush family. Well, now, if we may continue with the inspection, I have saved this main entry hall for the last of our little tour. <laughs> Impressive. Just look at all those full-length portraits. But those paintings must be... Are they all who we think they are? Frushes. Every single one of them. They are all of them our ancestors, Cousin Susan. Yes, indeed they are. Oh, (laughs) that fat one with powdered wig in the big pot belly. (laughs) He's so funny. (laughs) Who is he? That is Josiah Frush, the man who built this house in the year 1731. A prince among merchants. And that one, the one in the colorful uniform? Uh, Colonel Benjamin Frush served with the greatest distinction under Sir William Pepperwell in King George's War, 1745. I remember reading about him. Isn't that perfectly thrilling? A great hero. And so romantic. Mm. Oh, who's that stern-looking one? The one with the frown. That is Elbridge Frush. Lawyer, jurist, educator, political leader. One of the founding fathers of this commonwealth. First president of Frush University. And that one. Cousin Susan, just look at him. Which one? The one to the right of the door. Dressed in the clothes of the American Revolution. Oh, isn't he just the handsomest man you have ever seen in your entire life? And so young. He is beautiful. Those piercing blue eyes seem to penetrate right into you. Do they not? But those eyes are so sad. Which one of the thrushes is he, Mr. Willoughby? Uh, That lady is his young Cuthbert Thrush. Cuthbert? I don't seem to remember hearing about him. When did he live? In the 1770s. What did he do? What was he famous for? You must pardon me, ladies. This is one subject I do not care to discuss. 
Another cup of tea, Cousin Amy? If you don't mind, Cousin Susan. What a wonderful day this has been. First thing tomorrow morning, I shall start delving into the complete history of all of our ancestors. Find out everything I can about each of them. Cousin Susan. Yes? The portrait to the right of the main entry. Cousin Cuthbert. Mm. There's something strange and fascinating about the expression on his handsome face. Mr. Willoughby knows more, I think, than he was willing to say. I must agree with you. Mm. Let's be perfectly frank, Cousin Susan. Doesn't that look in Cuthbert's eyes do something to you? Really, Cousin Amy, I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, come, dear cousin. You said yourself that his eyes seemed to look right into you. I suppose I did, didn't I? But they are sad. And so melancholy looking, they seem to be saying, Help me, please. I need you desperately. Exactly the feeling they gave me. Have you any idea why Mr. Willoughby was so reluctant to discuss Cousin Cuthbert? Do you hear anything? Music of some kind. Somebody's whistling. It's Yankee Doodle. Seems to be coming from that window. Come, let's see. Oh, please be very careful, Cousin Amy. Open the drapes slowly. Cousin Susan, quickly. Quickly, come here at once. What is it? What's wrong? Look out there. In the dark. Do you see what I see? Where? Up, up there. Among the branches of that huge tree. <gasps> it can't be. Do you suppose it... Oh, it is the face and head of Cuthbert Frush. Tilted over to one side. Floating in the air. Bathed in a kind of eerie blue light. Just his head and face. Nothing more. Without a body. I can't believe it. And his eyes seem to be pleading for something. Just exactly the way it is in the portrait. I will not look at it. Oh, it's terrifying. Susan, why don't we go to our bedroom? Oh. We're both very tired. Which may be why we're seeing things that cannot be. Yes, as you say, Cousin Amy. After a good night's rest. We'll both of us laugh at what we think we've just seen. <laughs> yes, but we did see it. Imagination plays strange tricks sometimes. Oh, come, let's admit it. We've had Cousin Cuthbert on our minds ever since Mr. Willoughby showed us the portrait. <laughs> it naturally follows that, that... we should see his head and face floating in the air outside in the dark among the branches of that old tree. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, Cousin Amy. We'll talk about it in the morning. <sighs> just, no, just take your lamp and follow me up to our bedrooms. Yes, huh? I'm sure you know best. And all these wonderful portraits. <sighs> Good night, Colonel Benjamin Frush. I'm sure General Pepperwell was very proud of you. And good night to you, Cousin Elbridge, President of Frush University. And sleep well, Cousin Josiah. And you... There's that whistling again. Cousin Susan, hold your lamp a little higher. Yes, onto the portrait of Cuthbert Frush. What is it? What's wrong? Well, I... I can't tell whether it's the lamplight throwing strange shadows or... <gasps> Do you see what I see? It just cannot be. Tell me what you see. It's the same portrait of Cuthbert Frush we saw this afternoon. But with one horrible difference. His body is there. But poor cousin Cuthbert has no head. Just who is or was? Cuthbert Frush. Is it possible that in some way his spirit still lingers on in the old Frush mansion? Can we say with the poet Longfellow, all houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors, the harmless phantoms on their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floor. We will learn more when Mystery Theater returns shortly with Act Two. 
The cellars of the Frush Mansion are sound, cool, and dry, like the crypts of ancient churches. Several mornings after taking possession of the old house, Susan and Amy Frush decide to explore the vaults of these underground labyrinths. A recess in the thickness of one of the walls has yielded a small chest bound with hoops of iron. Slowly and carefully, the two ladies are doing their best to pry it open. Careful, Cousin Amy. We don't want to break it. I think I have it. It's coming. Ah, there. Goodness ah. gracious. This chest hasn't been opened, I'm sure, in almost a hundred years. Or more. Oh. Isn't this exciting? Oh. Let's see what we have. A couple of newspapers and pamphlets. Careful how you handle them. They'll fall apart in your hands. And two? No. Three packets of letters. Yellow with time. Look at that little package. Tied into a small bundle with a sprig of pale blue ribbon. Oh, sweet. Anything else? Oh, I had hoped it might be filled with old golden guineas. Hoarded by some ancient miser of a thrush. Oh, why not? <laughs> or even a handful of ducats, doubloons, pieces of eight. Stored by an unknown pirate ancestor of ours. <laughs> or some evil captain of a privateer. Captain Frush, who roamed the seven seas and preyed upon his helpless victims. <laughs> <laughs> you are an incurable romantic. Only a lot of old papers and letters. You know you can't wait to read them any more than I can. True. <laughs> Only I dare not handle them myself. They're so delicate. This is a job for the minister. Mm. Not only does the Reverend Mr. Patton preach an excellent sermon, but he's also president of the town's historical society. Mm. If anybody can help us with these, Mr. Patton can, I'm sure. Oh, they should provide many interesting evenings before the fireplace. Cousin Amy, mm. um, has it occurred to you that we might find things in these letters that we might not want to learn about? Well, like what? Um, I'm not quite sure. Well, I... But if we should discover something bad about an ancestor of ours, any one of I them... I don't think I would want to know. Well, suppose it was something about our mysterious cousin Cuthbert. Something really naughty. Wouldn't you want to know about him? No, I'd have to think about it. Oh, no, you wouldn't. And neither would I. If anything human happened with Cuthbert or any other fresh... With all those dignified pillars of society in the entry hall, I would be delighted. What? Come on, Amy. Really? And the first thing I do in the morning is to get in touch with the Reverend Mr. Amos Pettingill Patton. We'll need his help with these letters. before your dressing glass. To look at himself, to admire himself. Oh, I see you don't believe me. Of course I believe you. He had his back to the glass. He was standing there, staring, looking at me in my nightgown and wrapper. Oh, I was so terrified I couldn't move. Oh, I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed. Oh, now, please try to remain calm. What oh. did he look like? 
Oh, his clothes um, were, were, were strangest fashion from another age. Knee breeches, long stockings, a lace ruffle about his neck, a cocked hat, that sort of thing. Like the paintings yes, yes, that yes. we... His face, what did he look like? Oh, well, the light wasn't bright enough for me to make out the features. I was too uh, frightened to notice. But I do remember that the neck was bent, sort of. The head was tilted way over to the one side. To one side? Oh, it was awful as though the head were just barely attached to the rest of the body. Oh, you've got to stay here with me. I will not stay in this room alone. Of course, of course. I wouldn't think of leaving you. Cousin Amy, we're not alone in this house. There is a third person here somewhere. Just lie down now and close your eyes. I know what I'm talking about. It may well be that all our talk about those old letters we discovered... I did not imagine anything. I saw him. The walls we touch in this old house, the floors we walk on, all have secrets. All secrets. Some remembered, some forgotten. We'll both get used to it, I'm sure, after a while. Now, close your eyes and try to get some rest. Well, good night, Cousin Amy. And thank you. Not at all. Until you fall asleep, I'll sit here in this old rocking chair. <gasps> Merciful heavens! What's wrong? Oh, there is a man sitting in this rocking chair, and I'm sitting in his lap. No! And he's whispering in my ear. Oh, what's he saying? He's saying, I beg your pardon, Cousin Amy, but you're sitting on my lap. <gasps> what was that? The door just slammed shut. There isn't a bit of wind tonight. It's in the rocking chair. Look at it. It's rocking back and forth. All by itself. Oh, let's get out of here. Quick, quick, quick. We'll lock ourselves in my room tonight. Wait, wait for me, Amy. I'm coming right with you. A bit more bacon, Mr. Patton. Another egg? Uh, no, thank you, my dear. Thank you so much. Oh, bless my soul. Perfectly delightful breakfast, Miss Amy. I'm Susan, Mr. Patton. I'm Amy. Oh, yes, of course, of course. So you are. You've already told me twice now, haven't you? <laughs> One of my worst failings. About the letters and papers we found in the chest, Mr. Patton. Uh, yes, indeed. I've gone through almost half of them. Should complete a first reading of all of them by tomorrow. More coffee, Mr. Patton. Oh, uh, thank you, Miss... Uh, uh, Susan. Susan. Have you found anything at all thus far that might be of any interest to us? Well, that depends a bit on what you ladies would consider interesting, <laughs> doesn't it? Well, we were just curious as to whether you might have come across anything that might show one or two of them to be a little less... Uh, a little less proper, a little more human, shall we say, little chinks in their armor. Exactly. Oh, well, nothing really shocking. Just something that might possibly explain uh, certain things. Well, there's nothing like that in the letters as yet. Uh, what certain things, may I ask? Amy means, uh, have you found anything in the letters that might tell something about... Cuthbert Frush. Who? Cousin Cuthbert Frush. Oh. <laughs> that rascal. <laughs> rascal? Why do you call him a rascal? Well, I thought everybody knew it. It's practically town history. But when we asked Mr. Willoughby about Cuthbert, he did not seem eager to provide us with any information. Oh, well, now Thomas Willoughby is a bit of a stick in the mud, isn't he? Mr. Patton, certain strange things have been happening here in this house. Things that we do not understand. Mm. Uh, things that we are convinced may possibly stem from whatever may have happened to the man that you call a rascal. Uh, exactly what has been happening? Uh, for the time being, that must remain our little secret, my cousins and mine. In, in the meantime, it is of the utmost urgency that we know everything there is to know about Cousin Cuthbert. 
Why did he die so young? And how did he die? Well, my dear, dear ladies, the fact is that Cuthbert Frush, born in 1747, as I recall, came to his end in 1775 at the age of 28, hanged by the neck until he was quite dead, on that old oak tree, there, outside the window. <laughs> The Reverend Patton's expected almost any moment. With the rest of the letters. He did say he'd be here at eight. Yes, he did. Oh, I can hardly wait. I am so excited. Oh, so am I, Amy. Mm. I cannot get used to the idea that darling cousin Cuthbert was hanged. On a stout limb of that old oak tree out there, where we saw his head the other night. That's why it was so dreadfully twisted all the way over to one side. Because hanging breaks the neck. True. But don't say it. Well, it's a most peculiar effect. And that also explains that look of pitiful sadness in those young, hauntingly beautiful eyes. Indeed. Oh, Mr. Patton's usually so prompt. Cousin Susan, have you the slightest suspicion? The faintest inkling of what our gallant young cousin might possibly have done to deserve the fate of dangling from the end of a stout rope? None whatsoever. Oh. Let us hope we shall now find out. The poor, poor boy. Bless my heavenly soul. It's quite a night, quite a night. Isn't it, Miss Amy? Uh, Susan. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, may I take your raincoat and hat? Oh, thank you, thank you indeed, Miss uh, 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 Amy. Correct? Correct. The papers, the letters, you brought them, of course. Uh, right here, wrapped in this oil skin. Uh, here we are. And, 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 and I have good news for you both. The most splendid news. Oh, shall we sit here, close to the fire? Thank you. Now, if I may, I should like to begin with a question. Yes, yes Mr. Patton. Patton. Truthfully, why are you two dear ladies so anxious to find out whatever you can about an ancestor of yours who's been dead for over 125 years? Since 1775. Particularly since you think there may have been something, shall we say, a trifle naughty... In his background? Oh, we've already told you, Mr. Patton. We want to know everything there is to know about all our ancestors. Uh -huh. I think I understand. Uh, Mr. Patton, what would you say if we were to tell you that although Cuthbert may have been hanged, that in some strange way we cannot explain, Cuthbert is still with us? Uh, in spirit, of course. As are all the freshers. Cuthbert is still here, living with us in this very house. We've seen him. And he's, he's trying to tell us something. He wants something from us. Well, bless my soul. You don't believe us, do you? Well, you must admit the idea does stretch one's powers of belief just a trifle. Then come with us to the outer hallway right this minute. As you wish, Miss... Uh, Amy, uh, we want you to see something. Delighted, delighted, my dear. Now, is the light good enough for you to see? Oh, certainly. All right, then. Cast your eyes up at that oil painting of Cuthbert Frush. I know it well. I've seen it so many times. Oh, no. No, I will not believe it. The painting is an absolute blank. <gasps> There's absolutely nothing on the canvas. Oh. First the head was gone. Now it's the whole body. Oh, Mr. Patton, will you please come back with us into the parlor and be good enough to tell us what you found in the paper? And why Cousin Cuthbert was put to death? It might help us to understand why this... this third person is still hanging about the house. It's said that even the most welcome guest 
gets to be a bit of a nuisance after the first three days. And that applies in some measure even to the engaging spirit of Cousin Cuthbert. The longer he stays, the more demanding his presence seems to become. For he has presented a dark and challenging mystery to his two spinster cousins. And they are determined to unravel Cuthbert's 125-year-old secret. And so am I. We'll learn more about that when Mystery Theater returns shortly with Act Three. Oh, my kids love chocolate milk. This isn't just ordinary chocolate milk. A footstep, a low throbbing in the walls, a noise of falling weights that never fell, weird whispers, bells that ring without a hand, door handles that turn when no one was at the door, and bolted doors that open by themselves. So did the poet Tennyson describe some of the possible goings-on in a house shared by a ghost. Amy and Susan Frush believe in what they see and hear. Their present task is to convince the Reverend Patton, if they can. Now, do you believe us, Mr. Patton? Do you believe that in some inexplicable way, Cousin Cuthbert has left that picture frame and is wandering about the house? Cousin Amy and I have actually seen him. And you think he's staying on because he wants you to do something for him? And it would help tremendously if we could know why he was hanged. Have you come across anything in the letters? Was there an unhappy love affair that ended in his committing murder? Did he kill someone? A a jealous husband? Or was he a dashing pirate who was captured by the king's navy after a bloody battle on the high seas? What unspeakable things did he do to deserve to be hanged? Oh, please tell us. I, 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 I will, I will, if you'll give me a chance. Was nothing quite as romantic as you suggest? Oh. Oh, what was it, Mr. Patton? Now, you both read your early American history. Think back. What was one of the weightiest things on the minds of the American colonists? One of the things, in fact, that led to the American Revolution. Paying taxes they considered unfair. (gasps) Taxation without representation. Right on the head, Miss... uh, Amy. uh, Amy. And the only way... A patriotic colonist could show his defiance of what he considered inequitable taxes put upon him by the British was to smuggle articles like tea, brandy, rum, molasses into the country without paying the taxes. You mean Cousin Cuthbert was a smuggler? A good many of the townspeople here, being so near the sea, made a very bold living out of smuggling. Is that why they hanged him? If they lived by smuggling, sad it is to say that some of them proudly and defiantly died for it. Oh, like Cousin Cuthbert. Several of these letters speak of his smuggling activities. He was admired here as one of the best until he was unlucky enough to be caught and hanged for what was then considered a capital crime. Hanged for a little thing like smuggling. Yes, in the eyes of King George III's officers, it was not such a little thing. Cuthbert did commit an error, a human error, but as we know, to err is human. To, to forgive divine. It exactly. What's what exactly? I know what's bothering Cuthbert. You do? The first thing we must do is to visit his grave in the old churchyard. The way I look at it, the only crime Cuthbert was really guilty of was the crime of being caught. <laughs> Good boy. The entrance to the churchyard must be through that gate. So it is. Cousin Susan, here's the fresh section of the burying ground. Oh, just look at all those beautiful headstones and monuments. 
You know, it's it's hard to make out some of the names. Who's that? That's Benjamin Frush, the soldier. Oh, here's the grave of dear, dear Cuthbert. Oh, oh uh, cousin Susan, yes. put the little vase of flowers at the foot of the grave. They are lovely. Mm. They should please him. Do you mind if I begin? No, not at all. Dear Cuthbert Frush, Cousin Susan and I know why they hanged you. We would like you to know that not only do we not look down upon you for what you did, but that we do not in any way disapprove of your actions. We are sorry, of course, that you were caught and hanged on the oak behind the parlor. At the tender age of only 28. We also sense that you are unhappy and restless in this grave. You want to be forgiven, don't you? You want peace and rest. And that pleading look in your eyes tells us you're trying to say something. That possibly you want our help. What is it you want us to do? A vase of flowers toppled over and broke. Cousin Cuthbert, is this your way of telling us you hear us? Oh, answer us, Cuthbert. Talk to us. Quiet. Talk, Cousin Susan. Shh. Oh, dear. Oh, well, then, that was sweet of you. Thank you, Cuthbert. What was that? Cousin Cuthbert just kissed me ever so gently. He did. On the forehead. Oh. Yes, Cousin Cuthbert. Is he saying something? Shh. Oh, of course, dear Cuthbert. Now I know exactly the kind of thing you want us to do. What is it? What did he say? Cousin Susan, I hope you won't mind staying alone for the next few days. I'm leaving in the morning. Where to? Why? What are you planning to do? Oh, just for a few days. A very important errand. Oh, but we have the 4th of July celebration coming up. We've invited Mr. Willoughby and Mr. Patton. Oh, I have no intention of disappointing them. Oh, don't worry. I'll be back by the 4th of July. There they are, ma'am. You're sure you've packed them well? I have a long trip. Yes, ma'am, I have indeed. Just be sure to keep the package dry. <laughs> Away from any heat, of course. Oh, you're sure I'll be able to manage them myself? Just take usual precautions. Oh, I adore the red, white, and blue ribbon you've tied it with. Mm. So appropriate for this time of the year, the 4th of July. Oh, uh, we try to please, ma'am. On the day we commemorate the birthday of our country's independence, it is my hope that a certain person will be celebrating his independence, too. That his spirit will become as free as our country's was in 1776. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> That'll be three dollars and a half, ma'am. Thank you and come back soon. Have another marshmallow, Mr. Patton? You, Mr. Willoughby? Ah. Oh. What a wonderful way of celebrating the 4th. Don't you agree, Mr. Patton? Oh, I certainly do, Mr. Willoughby. Fine dinner, now this bonfire. <laughs> Keeps reminding me of the famous words of John Adams on the eve of July 4th, 1776. He said that the anniversary of independence should always be remembered with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, bells, bonfires, and fireworks. Cousin Susan? Yes? Gentlemen? I would like to contribute one of those items to our celebration. These. Uh, what you got there? What's in that pretty package? Yes. <laughs> Chinese firecrackers. Oh, and, yes. and these are Roman candles. Oh, and man. here are pinwheels. Oh. And, and these are called salutes. Well, firecrackers and fireworks <laughs> displays? Now, where on earth did you get no, them? Don't, 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 don't you know it's against the law to bring those things into the state? Shall we toss the firecrackers into the bonfire one at a time? Oh. Look, here's a package for you, Cousin Susan. Thank you. One for you, Mr. Patton. Thank you. And one for you, Mr. Willoughby. Oh, well, no. Toss them into the fire. Oh, oh. oh. 
My soul, Miss Amy, what have you done? Is this why you went away to buy beer? How can anyone properly celebrate the 4th of July without firecrackers or oh, fireworks? Well, you uh, journeyed somewhere to, to another state where you could buy them legally and brought them into this state illegally. Oh, toss some more of them into the fire. All of you. Uh, 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 in the eyes of the law, Miss Frush. What you have done would be considered smuggling. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Isn't that perfectly wonderful? Amy, you become a smuggler. Why? Well, to show Cousin Cuthbert that we brushes are perfectly capable of taking the same kind of receiving. Capable of the same kind of bold deed he's been hanged for. You see, he wanted us to perform a punishable act of righteous danger, as he once did. I did what I did to prove to him that we considered his act a human one. As you said, Mr. Patton, to err is human, to forgive, divine. But, but that was quite a risk you took. If it works, it will have been worth it. Cousin Amy, look up in the old oak tree. It's Cousin Cuthbert. The whole of him. And for the first time, Cuthbert, since we've known you, your eyes are not sad. In fact, you're actually smiling. Oh, Cousin Cuthbert, you are beautiful. He's beginning to fade. I can see right through him. He's getting fainter and fainter. Oh, please. Hey, Cousin Cuthbert. He's going away. He's gone. I... I rather think I shall miss him. It was comforting to have a handsome young man about the house, wasn't it? Even if he was a... Uh, Mr. Willoughby, Mr. Patton... Uh, yes, Miss... Uh, uh, Amy. Uh, Amy. Mm. You must think our behavior a trifle uh, peculiar. Well... If, if you saw or heard anything unusual, do forget it, please. I, I didn't see a thing. Did you, Mr. Patton? Oh, no, no, no. Not a thing. I didn't hear anything either. It's getting a bit cool, isn't it? Shall we have our coffee inside in the parlor? The coffee will only take a moment. Cousin Susan, gentlemen, look. What is it? The portrait. The painting of Cuthbert Fresh. Well, bless my soul. It's whole again. The four Portrait is back on the canvas. The way it was to begin with. Hold your lamp a bit higher. And look closely. Do you notice any other difference? The eyes. Of course, the eyes. Where they were once rather sad and mournful, they now seem to have a twinkle in them. And so they do. Cousin Amy. Yes? Did you see what I saw? Cousin... Cuthbert just winked at us. (laughs) I'll be back in a moment with a final thought. Do you know what's in your credit files? You should. Others do. Now you can... If it's happening now, you're hearing it now on WMAQ. We are all news, all day, every day. W-M-A-Q. 